Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you all for joining us in the European Parliament today. My name is Daniel Hannan. I'm a British Conservative MEP, not for much longer, of course. I'm uh, in my last few weeks in this job. And one of the things that I've learned over the last 20 years is that a continuous chronic problem with politics is that people allow the immediate to drive out the important. People are always focused on what's happening coming immediately across the horizon at the expense of things that it really ought to be their jobs to contemplate as legislators. And of course, the huge changes already being wrought by tech in general and artificial intelligence in particular are, uh, if you like, the, the definitive example of something that has been ignored. There was the, the very famous uh, parallel drawn by Nick Bostrom in his 2014 book about the owls and the sparrows. The, uh, the, the sparrows say, let's tame some owls to help us catch prey and help us build our nests and so on. And they, they go out and they find some owl's eggs. And then only as the owlets are hatching do they say, oh, does anyone know how to train an owl? And his point is the, the vast growth of AI in terms of uh, the legal and regulatory framework is like that. I tend to be instinctively quite optimistic about this. I'm not, I'm not, a, I'm not a great believer in the, uh, the Musk hawking theory that uh, humanity is going to be left redundant by superintelligence. Uh, I just, I, I, I'm hoping to hear many more expert voices than mine today. But I think we are dealing with rather more, more prosaic attitudes than, let's say, the Terminator uh, problem, right? Uh, we have, we have uh, issues that we genuinely have to address now about algorithms, uh, ownership of data, and so on. Uh, apart from anything else, it just seems to me, if you, if you look at the way in which uh, computers are beating us at chess and flying planes on their own and so on, it seems fairly clear that you can have very high levels of artificial intelligence without any sentience or consciousness. But as I say, there are probably uh, cleverer people than me who will talk about that in a moment. Why I, will, uh, why I find today so interesting is because I'm aware of how much brilliance and expertise there is in the field, I tend to be convinced by whoever was the last person to make a good case. I, I listen to the people from Google, and I, I walk away completely convinced by what they've said. And then I listen to the people complaining about their algorithms, and they seem equally convincing. Uh, because, of course, in both cases, they, they know how to marshal facts, and they're on top of their data. So I hope that over the next two hours or so, we can take a moment to stand back and consider from first principles the issue of how we have light but effective regulation so that we create a framework that is as friendly as possible to innovation and to technological breakthroughs, but that that happens in a way that protects individual freedom, uh, intellectual property, and privacy rights. So I am going to hand over to uh, my, my friend Max Rangeley, who is going to moderate and be our MC uh, for the next hour and a half. Max is a colleague of mine on the Initiative for Free Trade. He has been running the Cobden Center for four years. The Cobden Center is a charity that campaigns for free trade and sound money. Uh, he was one of the first people to uh, understand the importance of blockchain. He organized uh, three years ago here a five-chain summit on the policy implications. Uh, he's a fellow of the Mises Institute, but his first love was AI. And it's really thanks to Max that this conference is happening and that we're all here in this room. Max. Thank you very much, Dan. As Dan said, of all of the technologies which are currently emerging, I think artificial intelligence is the most profound uh, although I studied economics, I've really had a passion for AI uh, since I was a teenager. My father actually ran a software company who would recommend that I read the books of Ray Kurzweil, who made predictions about what would happen if computers kept on doubling and doubling in power every two years or so, uh, and was able to predict uh, when computers would beat humans at chess, when we would have self-driving cars and so on, with, with re quite good degrees of accuracy. He's now head of engineering at Google. Uh, it was clear to me that AI was different to other technologies. Uh, yesterday, I spoke uh, here 
in the Parliament at an event on economic history, uh, talking about the history of technology. And in economic history, one of the concepts that we have is general purpose technologies. That's technologies which permeate every sector of the economy. So an example would be electricity. And Andrew Ng, uh, who was a professor of AI at Stanford, who's, has compared machine learning especially to electricity. I really think AI has the potential to be the most important general purpose technology of all. Uh, a single development in AI can benefit sectors ranging from medical developments to financial products. But we should also remember that AI is more than just a general purpose technology. It really has the potential to be uh, a new phase of evolution. And our best, our best estimate is that life began on this earth about 3.8 billion years ago with bacteria and archaea. Uh, from about 900 million years ago, we had multicellular life forms, and about 500 million years ago, the Cambrian explosion happened. The first fossilized primate that we have, known as Ida, dates from about 50 million years ago. And then from about 200,000 years ago, roughly modern Homo sapiens uh, were walking the earth. About 2,500 years ago, the ancient Greeks developed what we would now know as the scientific method, which essentially contributed to the mind becoming in a way, a new form of evolution. And then a little under 200 years ago, Charles Babbage invented the computer and Ada Lovelace wrote the first computer program. And I think the development of the computer is that important. It's, it's fundamentally different from uh, all other technological revolutions. It will, in a way that's different from blockchain and, and the other areas that I've uh, contributed to, uh, it really does have the potential to bring about a new phase in evolution. So I thank all of the attendees here today who are taking part in this discussion. And this really is uh, the most important discussion that we can have at the moment, I think, in terms of future developments. We're going to have John Shaw Taylor. Uh, John was awarded a scholarship to study mathematics at Trinity College, Cambridge, in 1970. Uh, he obtained a PhD in mathematics at the University of London, uh, after which he moved into computer science uh, in 2006, he moved to UCL to become the founder of the Center for Computational Statistics and Machine Learning. Uh, and he's, he's now head of the computer science department at UCL, the highest ranked computer science department in the UK. He's also been instrumental in assembling a series of influential European networks of excellence. And he is, of course, also the UNESCO chair of artificial intelligence. Many thanks. Uh, thanks for the invitation, Max, and thanks for the... Uh very kind introduction. Um, so uh, what I wanted to do in this um, short presentation was perhaps highlight some of the issues. I'm certainly not, I don't um, profess to have solutions anyway. I'm not, I'm not a, uh, a person who has any experience in developing regulations. My background, as you've heard, is more on the side of the technology and its underpinnings. However, in recent uh, months, I think everyone has been thinking about AI regulation to some extent, so much of what I say I think will, will resonate and possibly <clears throat> irritate you. But I hope you'll find that what I'm trying to do is give a perspective that will inform future discussions through, through this meeting. So first of all, I wanted to highlight um, very briefly what AI has the potential to offer, which has already been covered to some extent, but as, as has been said, <clears throat> there are broad swathes of sectors where you will potentially create new uh, tools and methods that will impact people's well-being. Healthcare, we've heard mentioned, smart cities. Uh, the way we interact with technology uh, will be completely transformed. Uh, the way we access information already, but m will be further enhanced with deep and relevant information. Online education will suddenly become a joy. Um, disability uh, assistance will be you know, dramatically transformed, I believe. And talking about the next phase of evolution, enhanced perception. We will, in a sense, be potentially new beings through what we are able to, to uh, access and understand with the help of this in, uh, technology. And that's the way I would see, you know, AI taking over the world, by us taking over AI, not by AI taking over us, uh, would be the way I would think of it. It's hugely relevant for developing and, uh, as well, developing nations. And I just mentioned briefly an, uh, an application 
through a company called Zipline, which has revolutionized the distribution of blood in Rwanda through the use of, uh, of drones, uh, completely transforming healthcare provision in, in that country. I think it also has the potential to create bridges between cultures and peoples to reduce conflicts and misunderstanding. I, I fully appreciate that hasn't necessarily been happening, and perhaps the opposite has been happening to some extent, but that doesn't mean the potential's not there. And it further has the potential to tackle many of the key problems facing humanity uh, through what are known as the SDGs or Sustainable Development Goals that uh, the UN has proposed. So that's just to sort of set the scene. What are the dangers? Why are we worried about regulation? Just let's get on with it and, you know, all this benefit may, may uh, accrue. Um, so I think there are several and they're mixed and it's worth trying to sort of separate them out. Clearly there's the obvious loss of jobs as various processes have become automated. Removal of people from decision making in their personal and business lives. We have AI, this is the AI taking over our lives in some sense. Loss of privacy. And I mean that not just misuse of information, but just the fact that even if it's not misused, suddenly uh, there is the potential for misuse and that uh, exposure. I think one of the things that we've really seen emerge, which perhaps people hadn't realized when AI was developing how important it would be, is the ability to influence views of people. Advertisements are now so much more effective, fake news to influence opinions targeting of information to influence opinions. And here I mean, even if it's not fake, you can produce a, you know, a concatenation of opinions that will uh, encourage people to take on views that you wish them to take on without any fake news. So I'm not saying fake news is not a problem, but I'm not, I think it's not the only problem. And even, you know, well, I'll come back to fake news, but anyway, just that ability to target people uh, either because they ask for it or because they aren't aware of what's happening. An obvious one, weaponry, uh, use of AI to action attacks, the fully automatic drone fire uh, that has been highlighted as a, as a danger. Uh, but I think beyond that, AI robotics for mass warfare attacks are very potential danger, attacks on infrastructure, uh, as uh, I think you know, people are fully aware it has become much more of uh, a danger than we'd ever imagined. I think uh, further danger, misuse in policing and politics for detecting and attacking political opponents, and that I think we perhaps are a little bit here in the West, a little glib about that, but if you're living in uh, certain countries around the world, I believe you would be very, very aware of that danger. And uh, finally, a further deepening of the developing and developed world divide potentially being caused by this further enhancement of the develop, developed world's technologies. So you might, I, I think it's worth reflecting on what's new here, what's changed, why is AI different from any other new technology? And to some extent, I think it's overhyped, not that I don't agree with what a, a lot of what Max has said, but you know, We've been, you know, newspapers have been attempting to influence public opinion for more or less successfully for hundreds of years. So, you know, the idea that a technology is being used to try to harness uh, public opinion behind a certain set of views is certainly not new. Advertisers have been targeting groups of individuals through appropriate portals and carefully choosing their portals and their messages for different groups. To some extent, the only difference in both of those examples is AI is a hell of a lot more effective than those, those previous technologies were. There's nothing different in essence of what they're trying to do. It's just they're doing it a hell of a lot better. Um, similarly, political parties have taken control of radio and TV stations to sell their narratives in many cases, including uh, dodgy or dodgily presented news. What's different? Um, High-tech weapons have been in operation in all recent conflicts. They may not be strictly AI, but they're pretty close to AI, uh, certainly uh, in many of the, the elements of the technology. And uh, the issue of jobs, jobs are continually changing in response to new technologies. So again, what's new? Okay, so we, that's just the context. I'm going to now say a few things about what I think regulation should aim to achieve. Um, I'm not saying it can be done, but if, you know, in an ideal world, the kind of things we would like uh, a regulation to achieve. 
So I think reducing the ability of AI to gain access to personal information without consent, that's essentially what GDPR is attempting to do. Uh, I'm not saying GDPR is a perfect instrument, but I think it's a very good first attempt to try to uh, regulate that. But perhaps it could be, uh, you know, we need to keep reviewing and thinking about how that is uh, being done and what the uh, aims really are and what the side effects of that regulation might be. Reducing the ability of AI to influence opinions in a biased fashion. Um, I think that would be a very honorable and good goal, but a very difficult goal. Um, empower citizens to make informed choices in all matters. I think this perhaps is even more important. So trying in some way to uh, give citizens the insights and the uh, understanding that will enable them to make the right choices or to make informed choices. I'm not saying the right choices, but informed choices. Uh, ensure objective scrutiny in the use of AI in law enforcement and politics, covering that point, uh, and reducing the risks posed by new weaponry, weaponry enabled by AI technology. Thanks very much, John. And now, Nobuhisa from the OECD. Uh, Nobuhisa Nishigata joined the OECD in July 2017. He serves as an economist and policy analyst on artificial intelligence on secondment from the Japanese Ministry of Internal Affairs and Communications. Uh, before taking up this position, uh, Mr. Nishigata worked at the MIC in a wide range of senior functions, including regulatory authority of telecommunications and broadcasting, as well as the development of ICT technologies. Mr. Nishigata acquired his MBA from the Peter Drucker School of Management at Claremont Graduate University and bachelor's degree in agriculture from the University of Tokyo. And take it away. No. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much for the kind uh, introduction and uh, also the, the invitation. I'm very honored to be here to join the, the, this round table. And, uh, so the, thank you very much for giving us an opportunity to introduce our work on an AI. And our work in the OECD on AI uh, began in uh, 2016, uh, before even before I came joining the OECD, when we had actually I was in a t in a team on the hosting the, uh, the G7 ICT ministerial meeting in Japan at the time. Then like uh, the Japan pushed a little bit uh, for the like high-level principles on AI, and then the Japan proposed to, to, to proceed a discussion or maybe the development of some safeguard, or the guidelines among the G7 countries at that time. Then, then the OECD undertook the work uh, after the Japanese presidency at that year. Then, then that it's kind of beginning of the, our work in the OECD on the AI. Then, then we started a little bit the analysis, analytic works, and we had a big conference in uh, 2017 in the autumn. And uh, we appreciated many the European representatives from the government and the business and the, as well as the, the academics. And uh, we had like, a, it, it was a two-day conference, but we had like a 300 audience every day, I and mean, each day. So it was a very success. And uh, now we had many I input from the, the conference as well. Then, um, like, uh, based on our analytical work plus this event, and then we kind of reaching some consensus around and that the participants and those kind of the, the knowledge of people, then, then like AI policy is an urgent concern, and that the, the technology is growing very rapidly. So on the other hand, like we have to develop the, the good policies as well at the, the same pace with the technology growth. I mean, it's quite hard, but we have to try at least. And then the second one is, if they just think of the, the how far, I mean, the how wide the, the AI is going to impact on the society, then we have to take multidisciplinary approach, plus like a multi-stakeholder approach, then they're developing the policies. And the third one is going to be the, if you think of the universal reach of the artificial intelligence, it's no border on the technology. So in that sense, that it requires the global dialogue and the collaboration. Uh, across borders. So the, after these thinking, the findings, then, then the, this result, uh, the, uh, we have now currently the three different work streams. 
Uh, it's going to be the, the first one is going to be the development of the principle of the council recommendation and the establishment of the observatory. It's more like uh, after the council recommendation that we are going to observe the, what country is doing, what business segment are doing, like that, what the, 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 the development of the technology is doing. And the, the, for the basis, uh, the evidence-based analysis, it's just I'm personally working on right now, and it's, it's going to be the one to provide the base for these, the council recommendation and observatory work. And uh, these are the things that uh, like most government somehow do. And uh, my findings is like it's just going along with like a market pora. If you go to the market pora, if you know it, like a competitive advantage of nations, it just goes along with this. You know, just as creating the domestic market, that are creating the domestic resources, and that the government has a certain role to enhance these element. If the government desires to be the competitive position for the artificial intelligence and uh, so it's just beginning stage so like uh, just in looking at the many strategies and among the countries and the, the, their strategy makes sense so now we, we have like uh, maybe moving that to the state as OECD just looking at what works or what don't work those kind of things that it's, it's the next step and uh, I'm going to mention that a little later and uh, so just some pick up some good uh, interview some I would say that some good practice just uh, from the, my perspective though like uh, like just in, the, the good example is that, like uh, let me put that the Finland first like uh, they the, the fin Finnish government I mean the, the, they provide the AI courses the university level and the online like MOOCs right. And already 1% of the population uh, participated in this course. And or like uh, for the, the Korean government is uh, like setting the target, like how much engineers, particularly the specified in, I mean, special AI specialists or like a data scientists, researchers, engineers, and they put the, like a target numbers to, to foster the, the, these professionals. Or like, uh, let's say, Good one is going to be like a foster private investment, a competition, those kind of things. Like a, we need more private investment if you raise the, the certain industry. Like I mean, there's a certain limitation of the government support for finance. I mean, we just induce some the private segment to do focus on some certain industry, in this case AI, but on the other hand. So we need private, the continuous private investment, so then, then, then maybe the government can, what government can do is like a setting the higher goal, like a China is doing that, like a, they want to be like a, uh, the innovation center of the world in the AI by 2013, I mean 30. And before that, uh, she, he, the, they, they got the, the certain goal in the 2020, I mean 2025, like uh, to accomplish certain things. So I mean, it is not the, I mean the the, the mandate, the I mean the obligation, but the still, it's kind of the certain effect to the announce announcement effect to the industry. Then I mean, I mean, I'm not sure how how the Chinese industry they're going to follow to the Chinese government guidance, but still there should be some. And the, the European Union, I mean European Com uh, Commission is uh, doing the same thing, I would say, like uh, they are calling for the, the corporate and uh, concerted effort for the, to get the investment among the countries together to be competitive, and particularly I would say like uh, against the US or China who are leading the, the technology right now. The, the council recommendation is more like a beginning point. I mean, it's not the binding. I mean, it's more like a poli political commitment from the member countries, but it's not law, it's not a treaty. So, like, uh, we just, uh, once we can reach the uh, agreement among the member countries to, to, to adopt uh, the council recommendation, then it's more like uh, we have to watch the, the member countries and beyond there are some partners, including China, India, the Brazil, like a big countries, and how they develop the AI in each country, their countries. Then, so the, we are going to create the AI policy observatory in a few months, 
and uh, the core pillar is going to be like a policy analysis in countries and the national strategies and the measurement. The measurement is one of the biggest things we have to do tackle. I mean, it's quite tough right now. We don't have much data accumulation right now, but still we are looking for some proxies like uh, scientific publication, the patents, it's a kind of beginning things, but the still we are looking for the further index to, to measure the development of the artificial intelligence in the future. So then, then this observatory is going to be as well the multidisciplinary and the evidence-based and the multi-stakeholder engagement. We are looking for the partners and uh, we are starting talk with the uh, like a UNESCO and IEEE and the ITU and um, among, among the uh, big I international organizations to work together, uh, and uh, of course, including the European Commission. So then it's going to be like a, the particularly I have to mention that the European Commission and OECD has much more the complementarity of the work, particularly on the artificial intelligence. So uh, we are looking forward to working together and in a sense, several areas. So then this is going to be the end. And just to show the next slide, please, just an just introduction of the links. So thank you very much. Thanks very much, Nobu. Are you able to get the next slides up? And just in the meantime, I mean, Christian, someone also working in one of the global economics institutions, what are your thoughts on this? And is the IMF thinking along similar lines? So thank you very much uh, for having me here. Uh, thank you for the invitation. I think um, there are a lot of similarities between <coughs> what the OECD has said and other participants as well. I think we think that um, artificial intelligence is uh, unavoidable. It's uh, you know, the new revolution. Um, I read uh, somewhere on Twitter that uh, data is a new oil. So. This is clearly um, the new commodity. It's very hot right now, and everybody is trying to get access to the data. When we look at Europe, um, we see a very important digital gap, right, vis-à-vis -vis the U.S. Um, if you just look at some numbers, um, when you just look at the GDP of Europe, it's very similar to, to the U.S. GDP. But when you focus on the ICT sector, where you, usually you have a um, huge investment in terms of digital um, companies, and the ICT sector in Europe just accounts for 1.7% of GDP, while in China it's 2.1 and in the US it's 3.3. So just looking at the numbers, you already see that some other nations and group of countries are specializing themselves in the, in the AI race, while Europe remains a little bit lagging behind. When you focus on companies, just two European companies are <coughs> Two European companies are among the worldwide digital top 30 companies. We just have two big um, AI companies in Europe compared to, to the top 30 that we see. And only four European companies are among the top 100 AI global startups. Um, so the gap is there. Even within Europe, there is a huge heterogeneity, right? You have the Nordics where um, pro Nordics and Anglo-Saxon countries, the UK, where advances on AI um, are clearly there, but you then have the Southern European countries and some part of Eastern Europe where, where you don't really see progress. So you have a global digital divide between the EU and the rest of the main global um, stakeholder, and then you also have within Europe um, some, um, some, some gaps. Why should we care about AI and all this digital, um, digital business? I think everybody already mentioned it. We, from what we can we can summarize from the literature right now there are two things if you focus on the first moment just on the on the aggregate um, ai will bring productivity and ai is already bringing productivity when you look at firm level data you see that the huge productivity gains are coming from you know high tech companies and companies uh, which have embraced ai but beyond just this average you have to look at the second moment the distribution of these gains right so ai will also bring a lot of dispersion you will see uh, a fast growing uh, top companies and you will see uh, competition will probably um, have a negative impact on 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 the, on the on the laggards company so you will see productivity dispersion or productivity gaps wage gaps you will see a lot of people left behind as well in countries that are not really um, 
responding um, quickly and effectively to the to the AI disruption. So why we care about this is because the economic situation of people will affect their views and it will affect how they vote, right? So just the social aspect of it is very important. The one intervenant mentioned um, fake news and even just the, the existing news can be targeted and people will react differently. I, I would think that we're facing maybe a vicious cycle here, um, whereby AI can create disruptions and people will tend to react or accept fake news more easily just because their initial condition is already um, impaired. So if you're struggling economically, if you're out of the labor market for so long, you start believing in certain things, even even though they're not true, but this is the, 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 the narrative that you want to see. You, 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 you're looking for uh, an explanation and fake news will tend to affect the people who are really um, in desperate situations. So, we have to take into account the potential economic effect before we even um, understand why certain people will uh, embrace fake news easily. Uh, Robert Solo won the Nobel Prize in Economics for his work in, uh, in the history of economic growth. And he found that just under 90% of long-term economic growth comes from technological development. And as I touched on in the intro, a lot of this comes from general purpose technologies. Uh, a couple of economic historians that have done a lot of work on this are Landers and Bresnahan. But a general purpose technology is, is more difficult than other types of technologies in terms of using metrics to see how much economic growth it's bringing about, uh, say electricity uh, and these types of developments. And I think AI is, is going to be similar. Robert Solo, another growth economist, had actually commented on how difficult it is to measure the productivity gains uh, from the IT revolution. And I think probably that'll be even more so from AI as it really permeates pretty much every sector of the economy. Parks and Wellman did some interesting work looking at what they call machina economicus. So the way economists like to model the economy is by treating people as, as essentially rational. Uh, the term that's often used is homo economicus. Uh, what Parks and Wellman have looked at is that actually, as AI becomes used more and more throughout the economy, actually a lot of those economic models become more effective. So if you look at uh, AI, for instance, trading on markets, it is, it, its, its behavior a lot approximates what an economist would predict a lot more closely, as opposed to human beings, who we all know are to a large extent driven by uh, essentially ape algorithms that we've inherited from, from evolution. Uh, and Mann and Putnam did some interesting research looking at predicting the level of unemployment caused by AI over time by using the number of patents uh, in automation and then looking at a lag and seeing how that would affect things. Now, the, certain, the, the key weakness of that is really looking at how do you divide the patents up, which is, uh, which is more difficult than you might think. But in essence, that's, it's proven fruitful for economic policy makers in terms of looking at how many jobs may be at risk in the future. And I think really um, radical economic change often brings about radical political change. Uh, the Brookings Institution did a long-term analysis on this, relating it to, uh, to artificial intelligence, and found that it was certainly comparable to the printing press and other developments, which really contributed to a lot of, uh, a lot of political stability in Europe over the centuries. Yet, even th given that, there are almost no university courses in the economics of AI. Uh, when you look at this and how important it is, how much AI could, uh, could affect the economy, uh, most economics departments in universities will, will offer several courses in, in um, commodities economics and, and these types of things, but nothing in AI. Uh, so I th and I think in my experience, one of their concerns is that they just don't have the expertise. So, uh, so economic uh, AI engineers, I think we'll have to work more with economists in the future uh, so that we can put together these types of courses. And that's it. That's Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And so now, if we go to 
Ricardo Masucci. Uh, Ricardo is global director of private policy, uh, uh, privacy policy at uh, Intel Corporation and has previously worked as senior privacy and security policy manager for the corporation. Prior to this position, Ricardo worked in the European Parliament as an advisor to Salvatore Iacolino, MEP. Uh, Mr. Masucci obtained a bachelor's and a master's in international and diplomatic sciences from the Universita, Universita degli Studi di Trieste, Italy. I think that was pretty much right. Uh, thank you very much, Max, for, for this kind of introduction. Let me also uh, thank you, Daniel Hannan, for this kind of invitation. I'm thrilled to be here uh, with this panel of distinguished uh, speakers and, and the audience. So, um, as a way of introduction, I think I, uh, I mean, most of you might know Intel uh, as a tech company. Um, I just want to uh, stress the fact that uh, through our processors and memories and a number of other um, software and hardware solutions, we actually enable computing, we enable uh, data analytics. And um, it is uh, this data processing, it is increasingly happen, uh, happening in the cloud. It is happening at the edge devices. So um, this can be uh, automated cars, but any of the connected IoT devices or uh, in the cloud, in the data centers. So um, if we look at all the advances, uh, all the recent advances in uh, computing power, and connectivity, and uh, hopefully soon we will uh, enjoy also uh, 5G, uh, we can look at all these technology advances as a, an opportunity to further uh, enhance uh, you know, the, the, the possibility to, to derive value from data. Now, as a technology company, as a representative of, of a technology company, I, I can only be you know, uh, enth enthusiastic and excited about uh, the future uh, future perspectives, and I think that most of most of the speakers today share the same uh, share the same excitement. Uh, at the same time, we as a company acknowledge uh, the potential for risk for harm uh, related to um, artificial intelligence and um, data processing for artificial intelligence. Harm that could be uh, discrimination, uh, biases, that could be uh, translated into uh, economic or reputational uh, damage for individuals. So the question today, and uh, I think that we, that we try to, to address is um, how can we create that favorable environment for, uh, from a regulatory and business perspective in order to continue to use data in an innovative way, but also in a way that, uh, that is ethical for, for citizens. And so while I was preparing this uh, for, for, this, for this panel, uh, this is a panel on AI. Uh, therefore, I um, I thought that my answer sh should have been on, with three A and one I. So, uh, one A uh, would be accountability. Uh, the other A would be automated decision making. Access to data would be the third one, and investment would be the I. So let me let me try to go a little bit more into into detail. Uh, accountability. Organizations should hold themselves accountable for the risks related to data, data um, should actually uh, hold them, themselves accountable for um, putting in place all the technical and organizational measures to minimize risks linked to uh, data processing. Accountability approaches so would entail uh, privacy, safety, security, ethics, uh, uh, impact assessment throughout the design, deployment, development of, of products. Um, Automation should not translate to uh, less protection. Therefore, we should foster automated decision making, and so automated decision making should not limit it a priori. Uh, but actually, we should find appropriate safeguards for citizens. And when I when I think of safeguards, um, this could be uh, something linked to what we are doing on international voluntary standards on algorithm algorithmic explainability. Uh, Intel and other companies are involved at global level on uh, in this effort. And another concept that, that I wanted to uh, to share with this audience is the idea of having risk-based degrees 
of uh, human oversight in uh, um, uh, autonomous uh, decisions. Um, the, the, the third point, uh, access to data. Uh, having access to a reliable and diverse data set is of paramount importance for developing AI. Therefore, um, uh, the, the current situation could be improved by opening up government data, by um, in, uh, creating incentive models, um, government creating incentive models for companies to share data. Uh, and we should also make sure that the international data flows uh, are assured by, um, by governments around the world and there are no requirements of data localization in uh, um, in regulation across across countries, uh, the point on uh, on investment uh, investment in research and development is um, of paramount importance for uh, Europe, and and here is um, here is the reason. There are some um, public policy priorities uh, that could be addressed through uh, AI. Uh, and Christine was mentioned uh, mentioning some of them. Uh, I, I would add to to your list uh, uh, cybersecurity, uh, privacy. So um, there are very promising technologies like homomorph homomorphic encryption that could be levers for uh, using AI while protecting citizens. And so. Um, to, to conclude, um, Daniel, many thanks for the opportunity of, of um, having this dialogue between private and public sector. And I hope we can continue looking at accountability, uh, automated decision making, access to data, and investment as priority areas of, um, for AI to develop. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ricardo. And now we have Luca Bertoletti. Uh, Luca joined the Consumer Choice Center in February 2017 as European Affairs Manager. He's also held senior positions with the group Students for Liberty, both as a development associate and as an executive board member. Mr. Bertoletti also has experience as the economics and policy analyst for the fielder. Let's see if it's working. Yeah. Well, thank you, Max. Thank you, Dan, for having me here. Uh, well, just to present myself, I'm Luca Bertoletti. I work for the Consumer Choice Center, which is uh, a consumer group based globally. We are based in the US mainly, but we work a lot also here in Brussels. And uh, my talk today will be a bit shorter than the others, but uh, I want to point out uh, uh, some points about consumers and artificial intelligence. So we hear a lot about taxation. We hear a lot about the future of works uh, and jobs uh, for artificial intelligence. But nobody said what artificial intelligence has done for consumers uh, right now. I mean, if you think about uh, all the online services that you can actually have thanks to artificial intelligence, the retails, that, I mean, except for Belgium, everywhere else you can actually buy thanks to um, artificial intelligence, uh, and you can actually get some uh, products uh, the day after or even in the evening uh, in some countries, uh, even here in Europe. But on the other hand, there are two main threats, I think, to consumers. The first one is the use of data. Uh, how do we know that who is using our data, who is collecting our data? And I hear from many of you actually talking about China as the main hub for artificial intelligence. I honestly wouldn't say that uh, China should be our model for collecting data or even for creating artificial intelligence. I don't want to be a citizen who is, uh, who is uh, completely controlled by the state in everything that we are actually doing. And I think uh, China and what is China doing uh, with artificial intelligence uh, is that. Uh, on the other hand, the other main topic uh, that I would like to discuss is uh, where artificial intelligence is going and how many data we, we should give away to actually have uh, the future that we talk. It's true, artificial intelligence is helping a lot very different uh, um, developing countries. We hear about Rwanda, we hear about, I mean, we can see also what is happening right now in uh, Syria, where some type of actually uh, hates, of, uh, international aids are coming thanks to artificial intelligence and um, um, different type of drones. We hear that a lot about what is actually doing in Estonia, for example, where, I mean, I'm a, an e-citizen and thanks to actually them, I'm, the artificial intelligence can do everything from wherever in the world, uh, pay taxes wherever in the world. 
but how, ma how many data we should give away and what we can actually, and how we know, as uh, Ricardo said, uh, accountability, how much uh, uh, we know about how our data are used. And that's actually really, really important uh, because uh, in the future we believe that as consumer choice center, and personally, I believe uh, artificial intelligence will be mainly leading uh, the consumer uh, life. I mean, we can see it already right now in US that you can use uh, speakers and ask to have uh, deliver at home and you even don't use your phone anymore. You just talk to a speaker and after 30 minutes you have your food coming home. I mean, that's, if you think about it, uh, it's amazing. And I'm sure that in 10, 15 years, basically we can have an automatic house, an automated house uh, without even spending way too much as it could be right now. But on the other hand, we have to understand, and that's what actually I believe policymakers should do, is where, where our data are collecting and how they are used. Without that, and that's the ultimate threat of artificial intelligence, what about our privacy? Thanks very much, Luca. And Christian Layson graduated from KU Leuven with a master's in AI. Uh, next, he graduated at Vlerick Business School with a master's in innovation and entrepreneurship. He worked as an AI consultant and is currently the CEO of Overture, an Antwerp-based computer vision company. Thank you. So um, I would like to thank Max uh, for the invitation. It's great to be here. Um, I will touch upon some points that I believe are crucial in a debate like this. Uh, first of all, I believe that AI will help us solve many pressing issues. It will automate transportation and make it very, much more efficient. It will take over very dangerous jobs and also give us a deeper understanding of climate change. Next to that, it will improve healthcare and many other things. So AI and humans will converge towards each other, but that's not, not necessarily a bad thing. It will just be an, an inevitable thing. So consequently, I think that AI will contribute a lot to the global economy. Based on research from McKinsey, AI could potentially deliver additional economic output of around $13 trillion by 2030, boosting the GDP by, by about 1.2% a year. Automation of labor will be the biggest economic impact, but although that AI could replace some jobs, it will create even more. It is predicted that new jobs driven by AI investments could boost employment by 5%. Of course, that would require some workers to re-educate themselves. The economic impact may start slowly, but over time it will become very visible. To give you an idea, most of the things that a typical person can do within less than a second of thinking, we can automate or soon automate. So really complex or better creative things, it will be very hard to automate at the moment. But most of our day-to-day -day business operations are just strings of these split decisions. So companies are starting to see and more the potential of AI. However, we see that a slow start happens in a lot of businesses. And this is just because of the investments related to learning and deploying this technology. But they are starting to accelerate driven by the competition and the improvements in capabilities. As a result, AI's contribution to economic growth may be four times higher by 2030 than it is over the next five years. Of course, there are some technical and economical challenges with this. Technical challenges are, like one of my colleagues already told, algorithmic bias and also the transparency in algorithmic decision making and generative algorithms. These are things that we are faced with every day at our company, and we think they deserve more attention by the public. The biggest economic key challenge is that AI technology could widen the gaps between countries, companies, and workers. Countries that establish themselves as the AI leaders, most, of development con most, most uh, the developed countries, could capture additional 20 to 25% in economic benefits compared to today while emerging companies top out at max 15%. One level deeper, there could also be a widening gap between the companies itself. Front runners could double their returns by 2030 and companies that delay the adoption will fall behind. Additionally, small companies might be limited by the initial investment and the significant transition costs. If we go even one level deeper, so the workers, we will see that demand for wages and uh, sorry, the demand and the wages may grow for digital and cognitive skills, uh, 
and for workers with expensive or experience in tasks that are hard to automate. But opportunities for workers performing really repetitive tasks will shrink. I believe that education will be the key here. Due to these challenges, regulation will become preferable or even a must. I believe these regulations should be based on safety, privacy, and ethical decision making. In the end, how companies and countries choose to embrace AI will likely impact the outcome. It's like Max already told us, and like the famous AI researcher Andrew Eng said, AI is a new electricity. It's a driving force of the next industrial revolution, and like electricity, it's the greatest promise of AI will be the potential of improving the quality of life. But without the right amount of planning and cooperation, we risk exacerbating problems of inequality or dismissing groups of people. So I conclude that we have a unique opportunity here and a responsibility in this juncture of history to make a decision that will have European, worldwide and lasting impact not only to our own economies but on society as a whole. Thank you. Christian, thank you very much. Thank you to all of the speakers and a particular thank you uh, to Max for getting such a good blend of people together and so many complementary perspectives. I'm very keen that we should finish on time. 